Okay, great. So thank you very much. It's, it's, um, it's always a pleasure to be here and to uh, talk about internet surge. Um, I'm always excited uh, to talk about surge and especially the internet surge. And um, today I want to talk about uh, a very challenging problem, which is uh, internet surge. And to show you the progress we have done over the last, uh, I would say, five years on internet surge, I'm going to start with by uh, explaining why the problem is difficult and then move on uh, in, towards uh, uh, the solution. So um, maybe a few words about myself. If I, I, as you said, Charlie, I worked at IBM Research and then uh, founded Usurge in 2018 uh, to really try to, to deal with this challenging problem of internet search engine. So, maybe let's start with trying to understand a bit, to get a bit of an intuition to why building an internet search engine is so hard. So, there are many reasons, of course. Let me just uh, sketch a few of them. So, first, the web has over 150 trillion web pages. And only one out of uh, 3,000 has sufficient quality to be indexed. Um, a second reason would be that it is practically impossible to index all the words in every web page. If you think about it, an average uh, web page has about 300 words in it. So um, indexing requires an in depth understanding of which parts of the web page are really worth indexing. Another reason would be that one cannot build a competitive search engine without huge amount of users' data. So you have to collect user queries and clicks, and you have to analyze them in order to understand the behavior so that your search engine can improve. And maybe a last reason, maybe a last um, bullet is that it's too expensive to compute search results on the fly. So this means that most queries must be pre-computed in order to make an internet search engine practical. So I basically claim, or we basically can claim, that the state of the art technologies wouldn't really work to power a large scale search engine. So among the most popular search solutions, one can find Elasticsearch or Solar. So for example, Elasticsearch has definitely become one of the most popular open source uh, in, in search in the world today. So the main question is, why hasn't anyone built a successful internet search engine using Elasticsearch? And why do Elasticsearch-based search engine perform so poorly compared to Google? And there are mainly two reasons for that. The first is scalability, and the second is noise. So let me dive into each of the following, uh, uh, um, each of the following uh, challenges. So the first challenge you will be facing when you want to build an internet search engine with Elasticsearch is scalability. Now, the core algorithm of an inverted in the scheme is based on list intersection. And list intersection, as we know, is a computationally inefficient operation, which is quite impractical when it comes to the web with its billion of web pages. The second main challenge you will be facing is the noise. So when I say textual measures, we, when, when we say textual measures, we refer to the relationship of the search query words to the text in a web page. So for example, how many search words appear in the web page, the distance between two search words in the web page, the position of the search words in the web page, TDIDF, PM25, and, 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 and all other textual measures. Now, the main problem with all these textual measures is that they are lacking an in depth understanding of the query. So, relying on textual measures in an internet search engine is like making blind decisions. They might work very well on one query, but poorly on other. And evidently, Google barely uses any textual uh, measures in its search engine. So to overcome these challenges, we first have to agree on the following observation, which is extremely simple observation, but it's striking one. There is no point 
trying to index the parts of a web page that are unlikely to appear in prospective user queries. So what am I saying here? So suppose, for example, that for each web page, you had a list of all the search queries that ended up with the user clicking on this web page. Say we're taking the list of Google. We go to Google, we'll tell, we, we, we ask for them, give me the list of all queries that ended in a, in a click of all, of all your web pages. Then if you have this information, then clearly any part of a web page, pick any web page, then any part of a web page that doesn't interact with the possible search queries leading to this web page is completely irrelevant for the retrieval process. Hence, if you agree with this, you could focus on only indexing the search queries for the retrieval process, which is the major challenge since we have like 50 billion of web pages indexed that we want to pull out results for them. And in the end, out of 50 billion web pages, we want to show the best result. So, let, let me show you an example to explain uh, uh, what I mean here. So Cyberpunk 2077 is just an example. It's a video game. It's an action role playing video game, a very popular video game available for the PS4 console and for Xbox One. So here is a random web page about Cyberpunk 2077 that has title, the following title, a closer look at the vehicles in Cyberpunk 2077. Now, we have to be very careful and we have to carefully choose which, part, which parts of a web page are worth indexing and which parts are not. So amazingly, this is an extremely trivial text for a human and a human can glance at a web page and instantly pinpoint all the words and phrases that are uh, that, needed, that, that need to be indexed. Um, and indeed, if you will ask someone, anyone, what this web page is, is talking about, he will say for sure it's about Cyberpunk 2077 and vehicles. That's the content. That's what he will say. And the best way to verify this claim is by looking at user queries that resulted in a click to this particular web page. So we can go to Google and ask, okay, what, show me the popular queries that led to this web page. And here is a list of results. And as you can see, the queries look like that. Cyberpunk 20, 2077 vehicle, Cyberpunk 2077 cars. Everything is around Cyberpunk and cars and vehicles. And honestly, it's not really surprising because search queries are the best descriptors for a web page. In a sense, you can think of search queries as a contextual snippets of a web page. Now, if you do have the search queries leading to a web page, to every web page, then of course you can index only the queries. And what, what you get is a smaller index size, smaller index size, and less noise and most accurate results. So we agreed that we want to index only the prospective user queries, but this really means that the indexing problem, the same indexing problem that we have been working on the last 40 years is now turned into a prediction problem. And you can't really index anything before you predict the search queries that will lead to the web pages. And now the main question is, okay, how can I predict user queries? How can I come with an heuristics that for each web page predict for me the prospective user queries? So the first way, and, and this approach, um, this is the nominated approach that, that dominated in the last 20 years is by data collection. We can use browser extensions and SERP tools to track Google results. We can create a snapshot of Google query log meaning Google's query log, I mean a snapshot of all Google queries together with the web pages. Uh, so it, it's, a, it, it, it's a log of queries and the URLs that user clicked on. Um, this will give us some sort of a snapshot of Google query logs. And of course we will have the mapping. We'll have web page and queries and we'll have the map. Many try this approach, spend a lot of money on this approach and they all failed. So 
why this approach fail? First, whatever you will be doing, you will develop a solution which is completely dependent on Google or Bing. It doesn't really matter. You will be spending a lot of money on building infrastructure to support SERP tools, browser extension. You will be facing the problem on long tail queries. These are these queries which are very unique. They don't have high volume. And it's almost unlikely that browser extension or SERP tool will have sufficient information about them. And they constitute something like 30% of the queries. And of course, even if you do so, you don't really get a de an, a, 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 an in-depth understanding of the mapping between the queries and the web pages. So, but what am I saying here? That without, am I saying that without massive data collections, we are doomed to fail and we cannot predict user queries? Then I claim that not. So, and this is what we have been doing um, in new search for the last five years. So we claim that we can use an AI algorithms to predict the prospective user queries for each web page. So let me show you an example. Here is the web page of Game of Thrones, the main web page of uh, Game of Thrones from IMDb. So this is the set of popular user queries leading to this web page that were collected from Google. So you see Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones cast, season eight, season one, books, episodes. And here is the list that our AI algorithm generated for this particular web page. And what you see here is that there is a striking similarity between real user queries and the AI generated ones. And once we have this algorithm that can take this bunch of um, billion of web pages and do this prediction of what web page, what queries would lead to each web page, we get an histogram with probabilities ordered by the frequency, then we basically solve the indexing problem because indexing only the queries is much, much more efficient than indexing the entire text in a web page. And we already proved that we are not uh, decreasing the recon in any way. In fact, we, we can show that we are really not only, we, not only we are not harming the recall, we are increasing the precision. So now the question is the next challenge. Well, once we have the index and we have this queries indexed, how can we maximize the recall and the precision? So let's take a look at an example. Suppose that the user is entering the search engine, the following question, what is the release date? of Cyberpunk 2077 uh, to the PS4 and the X and Xbox. So the user wants to ask when this uh, video game Cyberpunk 2077 will be released to either of the consoles, PS4 and Xbox. Now, plug in this query to Google. And of course, Google unsurprisingly knows exactly that the context of this query is Cyberpunk 2077. And in fact, any web page, any web page in the world that is not about the game Cyberpunk 2077 will be irrelevant for this query. Don't bother to show it. Even if it contains the words Xbox One, PS4, release date, is that what? It's not relevant to this query. The context of this query is one, it's deterministic and it's Cyberpunk 2077. So how does Google know that? How does Google know that the context of this query is Cyberpunk 277. Now, this is definitely not an NLP problem. We shouldn't try to do any NLP analysis on this sentence because if I will plug in this query, release date, Cyberpunk 2077, PS4, Xbox, this bunch of four entities, Google will show me the exact same SERP. This means that given the set of entities, release date, Cyberpunk 2077, PS4, and Xbox One, you have to know what the context is, and you have to know that the context is Cyberpunk 2077. If you're still not convinced, let's make, an, let's try to answer the following question. Let's suppose for the same query, 
that in my entire index, my entire search engine has only two web pages, only two web pages indexed. The main, the main web page of Cyberpunk 277 and the main web page of PS4 console. Now, what result would you show first? The home page of Cyberpunk 277 or the home page of PS4 console? I have only two web pages in my entire index. Now, of course, the question is you will place first the home page of Cyberpunk 277. So you know that given the two entities, Cyberpunk 277 and X10 PS4. Cyberpunk 2077 is the context. That's all the information you have from this. And so this means that we need the ability to determine what is the context of any given set of entities. And if we agree with that, we, it means that we need to build a contextual graph and a contextual graph must support the following operation. I will feed him as an input, a bunch of entities and it will output for me the context. So we understood it about five years ago that the only way to really uh, tackle internet search is with a big contextual graph that can understand context and support contextual operation. So what is a contextual graph? How can we define it? So, the best way to understand what a contextual graph is, is to compare taxonomy, the, the same taxonomies and ontologies that we are all know and aware of into contextuality. So let me give you an example. So a common method to organize knowledge is to classify a given entity into an underlying taxonomy. And a typical taxonomy can have thousands of categories possibly arranged in a hierarchical way. So for example, the entity Nike can be mapped into categories like shoes, sporting goods, running, basketball. But if you think about it, and if you think about it from a perspective of an internet search engine, this is only half of the picture. Because if you ask someone what pops into his mind when he hears the name Nike, he will likely mention a completely different set of associations. He is likely to mention associations like Air Max, Cortez, Adidas, or LeBron James. And the categorical associations in the upper part are very different in nature from the contextual associations in the bottom part. Because while the upper part is very static, it hardly changes. The bottom part is very dynamic and changes rapidly in time and it captures human contextual associations. And you can see that, for example, the association LeBron James was created only recently as LeBron James signed the contract with Nike. So if we, under, if, if we agree with this separation of contextuality vast categorical separation vast contextual separation, so the main question we have to answer is, how can we model contextual associations and how can we separate contextual association with, how can we separate contextual associations and categorical association? Meaning how can we differentiate between the yellow vertices and the green vertices? So the best way to understand context is with a very simple experimental thought. So let's make a short, simple experimental thought. If we ask, a random group of people, what pops into their minds when they hear the name Nike? Around 5% will say sporting good. But if you will go the other way around and you ask the same group of people, what pops into their minds? They hear the word sporting good, only few will say Nike. Now, it's not really surprising because the probability that among all the sporting goods vendors in the world, someone will think of Nike is very low. And this is what characterizes taxonomical relations. The relations are dominated by only one edge. And let's continue with the experimental thought. 30% of the people will mention Air Max when they hear, mentioned Air Max when they heard the name Nike, while 90% of the people mentioned Nike when they heard the name Air Max. And this is an example of a uh, 
this is an example of a contextual association. It's, it's a two-sided relation. Nike and Air Max are highly contextually associated. When you think of one, you automatically think of the other. They are glued together with our brain. They sit together in some contextual network of our brain. And, and, and they pinpoint what a user might want to see when, he, when he's thinking about certain entity and what kind of augmentations we can make. So at USurge, what we did, and I will show application to search in, in, in a few minutes, we built the first, I think it's the first, at least from what I know, the first contextual graph based on the World Wide Web. So what, what is this graph? So the graph contains all possible contextual and categorical associations from any given entity together with their probabilities. So for example, in this figure, you, you can see a part of the neighborhood of the vertex Nike in our graph. And the yellow vertices are categories, while the green vertices are contexts. And the edges measure the probability that someone will think of a certain entity given another entity. So if you want, you can think of this as a contextual conditional probability. Now, of course, the higher the scores, the more contextually associated the entities are. And for example, Air Max is highly contextually related uh, with NAC. So we can say that given a query in which the entities are Air Max and Nike, show the, show the user the web page of Air Max and not the web page of Nike. So here are some statistics on our contextual graph. It was built by analyzing 5 billion web pages. It has 10 billion entities and 300 billion edges. And every day, I would say around 10 million new entities are added to our graph. It contracts itself all the time. Now, what's striking here is that you can see that the size of the graph is overwhelming in a sense. And, 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 and why is that? It's, it's because the fact that almost anything can be a vertex in this graph, any city, any book, any shoe, any restaurant, any car, any song, everything. And the scores on the edges are also changing continuously according to the ongoing events across the web. So maybe uh, a short slide about the challenges that we faced when building this contextual graph. So first we had, it's, it's a data collection challenge because the graph is built on top of the World Wide Web. Uh, so we needed to massively crawl and analyze billions of web pages. We had to know exactly what to extract from the web pages and to decide what terms or phrases or entities are likely to become vertices in our graph. We needed to create the contextual association between the vertices, and we needed to come up with an accurate estimation for this, for, for this contextuality score, meaning for the scores on the edges. And along the way, we faced many scalability challenges due to the size of this graph and the fact that we needed to perform operation on this graph very fast. Uh, so we have to build our own unique architecture to support those various graph operations. So we have taken a completely different approach. We haven't applied any uh, natural NLP or NLU or deep learning uh, uh, algorithms. We have taken a completely different approach. We appeal to neuroscience. And what we basically did, we implemented uh, what is called auto-associative networks, which are um, networks that operates in a similar way that our human brain encodes our memories and create and extract context from our daily episodes. So, the, the main technology here is, is an implementation of auto-associative networks together with statistical pattern recognition. We always try to mimic, uh, and there, there is a, a vast, uh, there, there is a, a, a lot of improvement in neuroscience in the recent years that now enables us to better understand what's going on in our brain and try to mimic it, mimic it as much as possible. Uh, so, Let's see some application to search, and let me try to convince you why basically a contextual graph is what you need if you want a user, if you want an internet search engine, and if you want 
uh, to really give to understand user intent, of course, in a place where we don't we cannot really collect uh, Google's uh, query log. So I would just say that our contextual graph is an integral part of our internet search engine, which has five billion web pages in English. And it is the first driving our understanding of the user intent. Uh, so let's see some example for, for what I think it's the power of the contextual graph and how it enables us to provide the Google-like search experience to our customers. So the first example would be that a query can have many different forms like synonym and acronyms. And a good search engine must predict all possible forms in order to retrieve all the relevant results. So suppose that the user searches for GTA. So GTA is a video game, Grand Theft Auto. Now, the right block, the right block represents the neighbors of the search query GTA in our graph. Hence, we can immediately see the GTA is highly contextually associated with the video game Grand Theft Auto. You see there, there is a 70% uh, probability that someone who is thinking about GTA means uh, referring to the, to the video game Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and of course, this is not surprising since GTA is the, is, the, is the acronym of Grand Theft Auto, the most popular acronym. So we deduce that they are in fact equivalent forms. But if you think about it, Implicitly, this also means that if you will try to replace GTA, say, with Greater Toronto Area, you will be showing irrelevant results for almost more all users. The conclusion is that if you want to enrich the query with more forms, you have to make sure that every possible replacement that you make don't take you out of context. As another example, suppose that the user enters the query gone win. So of course, as human, we know exactly easy that it means to the movie Gone with the Wind. Uh, there is no ambiguity here. So the query must be replaced. And this is if indeed reflected in our graph. And you see that the vertex Gone with is connected to the vertex Gone with the Wind and the score is 100%. No one on earth, when he hears Gone Wind, will think of something different than the movie Gone with the Wind. Just we are not aware of any such replacement. So the user intent here is unambiguous. And it means that when a user enters the search engine, the phrase gone win, he almost surely refers to the movie gone with the win. And you can replace the query and, and be very safe about it. Um, let's have another example, a last example. So sometimes the user intent is ambiguous, not as in the former case. And there are several possible interpretations for his query. So as a search engine, we have to predict the most popular interpretations and show diverse results. So for example, when a user searches for Don PS4, I don't, let, let's suppose I don't even know what it is. Um, we know from our graph that he means to one of the following video games, it, it, he means either Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn or Until Dawn or Far, Far Cry New Dawn. So, and, and these are the probabilities. So there are three major or three popular interpretations for this query. So we show him results for each possible interpretation. And that's what we do on our search engine. And this is exactly what Google does. As we can see from the figure on the left, Google also knows the three most popular interpretation for the query and it shows you diverse results to capture all those possible forms. So the only way, as far as I can see, or as far as I can tell, the only way to control the data and to be able to show accurate results from billions of web pages is by understanding the user intent and finding the smallest set of popular interpretation for every query now and uh, the possible set of interpretation for query, it's contextual augmentation, and you have to guess, okay, given Don PS4, what the user want to see, and you need to go, you need to search the graph and to find those contextual associations. Um, so I would summarize the talk as, from my point of view, the future of AI, definitely in the context of surge, is about context. And 
without contextual graphs, models of cognition will always remain somehow categorically limited. And Google has an amazing, amazing contextual power aggregated from user and many sophisticated techniques. And I think that what we have been trying to do in the last years is to bring this contextual power uh, to everyone. Um, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's been uh, fascinating to listen to. So um, do we have uh, any uh, question, questions for Roy for, on, his, uh, on his talk? Let's have a look at the, uh, the chat. Not so far. What about the room? Do we have a question from the room? I can't hear the room, I'm afraid. I had to mute you for background noise earlier. So Susan, we may have to come over and turn the mic back on. Does that work? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, great presentation. Um, I was wondering, do the contextual uh, probabilities vary more in time than the uh, taxonomy probabilities? I could see like, current events and that fluctuating a lot. Did you hear yeah, that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can give you some. Okay. We all know this famous, uh, we all know this famous example of uh, N95, which was Nokia cell phone, and now it's basically face mask. No one think of cell phones when they hear uh, when they hear N95. And we see those changes all the time. Uh, the contextual associations are ra rapidly changes over time. And connections that were relevant, say, a month ago or real are, are, might be irrelevant in a, week, in, in a week from now. For example, I recall a very nice example that we showed uh, from, from, from Hollywood that uh, it, there was some, uh, uh, there was some uh, movie, um, uh, Star was born with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. So there was a tight connection between Bradley Gaga Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. And then a week after that, Bradley Cooper got divorced from Angelina Jolie or something like that. And then suddenly we saw a huge connection between Lady Gaga and Angelina Jolie. And those connections evolved in time all the time. And you have to keep updated about, about what's going on. Because if a user searches for Lady Gaga, Gaga today, he might think of, of, of a completely different context because something completely different happened then what was, then like what might be like a week ago. So we see this changing all the time and we have to compute and estimate those probability based on the ongoing events across the web all the time. And of course, categorical associations, they are very static. Okay, Nike is it's shoes, it's basketball. It, 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 it will never change. It's, 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 it, 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 that's the big difference I think between B2C and B2C. B2C contextual, very dynamic, to be very static mapping into ontology taxonomy fixed sets and 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 they are complementary views completely complementary views um i, I hope i answered the, the question thank you so we've got a we're, uh, we've got a question from the zoom so let me let me just jump to that so uh alina asks um is there a robust way to construct contextual graphs for various domains yeah, so um, we constructed our contextual graph for, for the entire web, but what we do, um, we work a lot in cost for custom search engines and we build custom search engines, say like real estate custom search engines, personal finance uh, custom search engine, financial search engine. So we don't really work in the context of the entire web, but rather we stick to a certain vertical or a certain topic and, and build the contextual graph based on that. So this means that usually, if you say you're appealing to commercial real estate, you basically have a list of 100, 1,000 most popular domains in the context of commercial real estate. And then what you do, you train and you build this contextual graph on top of this domain, and you get a contextual graph which is dedicated for those specific set of domains that you chose. However, we have to bear in mind that in order for the contextual graph to be rich, we, we are not expecting domains like with 10 web pages. We, we, we need like we, we need like decent amount of web pages, say I would say like at least 10,000 or something like that for start for the contextual graph uh, 
to really capture all the entities and understand exactly what's going on. Okay, so, so yeah, do we have a question from the room? Yes, um, two questions. The first one is about the graph platform that <clears throat> you are using to host the graph. Is there one uh, specific one that you're using or you built your own graph platform? And the second one is, if you take the same query that we put at the beginning on Google, like what is the release date of Cyberpunk 77 and PlayStation 4, blah, blah, blah. Um, without an update, like how would the contextual graph in this case identify which entities are important in that query or in that question? Um, and without having labels on the edges that says this is the release date of that entity, which is the Cyberpunk, um, to PlayStation, and this is the release date to um, Xbox. Like without labels on edges, how do you know the relationship between those two entities, the PlayStation and the Cyberpunk in this case? So I will I will answer the first question. So uh, we definitely try to use existing architectures when we build our contextual graph. Uh, our contextual graph is basically more than more more as a hypergraph. And uh, we tried many solutions and they all failed. They couldn't scale up with the number of uh, web page, with the number of vertices and edges. So what we did, we basically appealed to uh, YouTube. So YouTube has a, a has an open source called Vites, which is uh, uh, it's um, it's 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 a cluster of MySQL, which is uh, can be distributed across many servers. And what we built. We took this MySQL cluster, we built a big MySQL cluster, cluster based on key values, and we, 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 we make it into shards. And on top of that, we build some sort of map reduce uh, jobs that help us to do the analysis. And I must say that this was one of the toughest things that we have to do to build this uh, architecture to support the contextual graph. And in the end, yeah, so it's my sequels, uh, uh, and it's my sequel in the other line. And, and what we found was amazing that if you're taking my sequel and you're using it right, basically you're using it as a key value, just key and a value, two columns, and you don't put secondary indices and you only use primary key and it's only a key value. Then you find out, and it's the same consequence that also our friends in Wix go to, and of course in YouTube, they go to the same conclusion that uh, a MySQL can be an amazing NoSQL solution. So um, that's what we appealed, that we knew the experience that Wix and YouTube have, and, 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 and I, I wish we, we, we discover it sooner, but um, once, we, once we saw that we knew that this is what we need, I hope this answered the, the first question. For the second question, so you have this bunch of entities, Cyberpunk 2077, Xbox, PS4, release date. These are legal entities in our graph. So you don't do any, any NLP, you just extract the entities from the queries. Now the entity can be anything. Release date, is a, it, it, it's a legit entity in the graph. And now you look at the edges, you look at the conditional probabilities. You need the edges you, you, without the con con conditional probabilities or without the scores on the edges. Of course, we, 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 there is nothing we can do. And you develop heuristics on top of the scores of the edges to pinpoint the uh, context given those set of entities. Okay. Hope that answers your question. We're gonna to turn to a, another question from Zoom now. So uh, Nina asks, uh, so is the cold start problem an issue here? Would a web page ever be found if it doesn't have any queries associated with it yet? In our search engine, it won't be found. What we do, our indexing process starts with crawling, taking web pages that we crawl into some, um, into some uh, what we call those auto-associated networks to predict the search queries. And only then we index the search queries. So we don't, so that's how we, we basically solve the cold start problem. We are taking the web pages first, predicting the queries, then and indexing the query, the queries, updating our contextual graph. And once our contextual graph is updated, we can answer the results. Okay. So we don't index with, I mean, we, we, we don't have Elasticsearch configuration. We don't have any configuration of, we don't have inverted index of any sort. Everything is indexed. We are not even using inverted index to index the queries. 
This also would be inefficient as there are so many queries containing say Barack Obama or Donald Trump. So even if you appeal only to the queries and you try to set up an Elasticsearch configuration only on the queries, currently we have like, I think uh, say 50 billion user queries. Um, then this is also, we, makes a lot of troubles when you try to do it on Elasticsearch. So we had to embed it in our contextual graph and only when it's embedded in our contextual graph. And of course our contextual graph, every entity in our contextual graph has a backward, has, has a linkage to the query that it's originated from. And of course every query is connected to the web page. So we go by reverse. We take the user query, we find the entities on the contextual graph, we find what we want, then we go back to the queries and then we pull the web pages. Now we don't pull one page, web page, we basically pull a list of 500, 1000, the most performing web, page, web pages. And once we have this finite list of 500, 1000 web pages, now we do all this, we have all the words of the web pages. Now we appeal to those 200, 300 parameters that you want, the domain rank, the it, everything that you want inside to really uh, to really rank this list. But now you are in a problem of ranking a finite list of 500 or 1000 lists that you know that agree with the recall of Google. So the, the challenge is to really fetch those 500, 1000 candidates uh, to show on the search. Fantastic, thank you. Um... So I, I think we've got time for one more quick question, if I can select one. Uh, I'm going to jump to uh, Bertrand. Um, Raphael, you've already asked a question at the last talk. Um, what data do you use to train the models that back your graphs? Uh, sorry, again? What, what data do you use to train the models that back your graphs? Uh, web pages, only web pages. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, 5 billion web pages. The input is only web pages. Everything is trained from web pages. Everything is unsupervised. There is no supervised learning there. Everything is unsupervised. The prediction is unsupervised. Of course, the parameters improve, the more feedback we get and the smarter we get. But basically the only input is only web pages. And we don't even collect or track user data. We don't aggregate clicks. We, we are completely private in a sense. We can set up a usage on a set of servers that only have web pages. Um, and that was, that, that was things that we want. That, that, that was a, a crucial for us because if you really want to build a private search engine, you have to, I mean, what, what is your input? Only web pages, you're not allowed to look at users. So the input is only web page because that's what the internet you know, is all about. And so far we haven't really used, we, we haven't, our search engine is not tracking users in any way. We, we have never used third party providers. Uh, we've never used any external NLP or other libs. So um, we really try to, to keep everything in house so that we know that we are completely independent and, and only web pages, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to have to stop there. Thank you so much, Roy. That was fascinating stuff. Um, My are, pleasure. Thanks. Uh, we're covering lots of different aspects of search and relevance today. So uh, thank you again. Um, sure. Uh, do, uh, hopefully, you, you'll be able to hang out in uh, relevant Slack if people have got further questions. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you for that.